Welcome to part two in the series how to apply for personal independence payment. Uh, in this episode we are focusing on completing the personal independence payment application form. Now what I have here is a specimen copy that comes off the internet. Uh, when you, as explained in the part one video, when you uh, order the form in the first place you get one sent out to you that's tailored to you so it has your name and your national insurance number and everything coded onto, uh, the, onto the form uh, which helps them uh, with their system in terms of scanning it and uploading it uh, when they receive it. So this is just a guide really uh, and unfortunately it does have specimen only right across the uh, centre of every single page. But bear with me on that. So when you receive your form, you'll have four weeks to fill it in. So as I mentioned before, if you're getting somebody to help you fill out the form, then uh, it's probably best to uh, get that arranged before you even order the form or start the process, uh, because it may well be that uh, Places like the CAB, Age UK, um, the RNIB, whoever it might be that would be supporting you with filling out the form. Uh, it may well be that they aren't able to uh, do that in the time frame if, if you haven't sort of prepared with them beforehand. They may have a waiting list or so on. Uh, the Department of Work and Pensions does have its own visiting service, so it's always worth thinking of contacting them uh, as to whether there's any availability for that in your area as to whether they can come and fill the form out for you. Um, anyway, we'll just get straight into it. I want to keep this video as short as possible. The, uh, the way a PIP form is assessed is they use what's known as descriptors to indicate uh, what points you would score through each section. So the whole system is based on points, but they're not points as in uh, if you like if you score eight goals, you've got eight points. It doesn't quite work like that. There's certain specific things that will get you a point, and if that specific thing doesn't happen for you, then you don't get that point. Uh, but generally speaking, they are looking at the number of points that you accrue over the whole application form to define as to whether. Uh, you're eligible or not. Uh, some people can get all of their eligibility in just one question. So it might be that they have such significant problems with managing their medication, for example, or medical treatments, that it, it requires that they entirely qualify for the lower rate of care. So of the care component. So, you know, it is, uh, it's important that you fill out each section in as much detail as possible um, so that you maximise the chance of hitting all those descriptors. Uh, the descriptors are available online to download from different places. I'll pop a link in the comments to uh, where I found them, but obviously bear in mind, uh, links don't stay current forever. So if that link is there, I'll try and keep it updated. But uh, if it doesn't link to, to there, just type in descriptors into Google, PIP descriptors or personal independence payment descriptors, and somebody will probably have posted them somewhere. If not on the, for example, the Citizens Advice website, it might be in a forum somewhere or on the disability uh, forum possibly. So do check that out. And that gives you a guide, then you have a printed guide, step by step, uh, each descriptor for each question. And you'll be able to say, well, can I demonstrate that I meet these descriptors in that question with by recounting what happens with me during my day? Uh, and, and that can be quite a good guide. So looking at the form. First section about your health professionals. Uh, this is generally speaking about health professionals. So if you see uh, the first one that should go on the list, obviously will be your GP. 
um, name, address, profession, uh, phone number, obviously, and when you last saw them. Uh, it doesn't have to be exact, exact with the when you last saw them. It could be, you know, last Tuesday. Uh, it could be June 2019. You know, it doesn't have to be specific. But if you've been for your doctor for any reason, even if it's a blood test, then that would be the last time uh, you saw anybody from your GP surgery. Uh, also put in there, it might be that you're uh, seeing a physiotherapist regularly. Uh, or uh, somebody for some kind of ongoing therapy, maybe speech and language therapy, something like that, that would go in there. I think there's three slots in the uh, current form. There's three spaces. If you're seeing any specialists, particularly within the last 12 months, or if you're seeing a specialist regularly, you've not been discharged, then that information needs to go in there. If, you're una if you've got quite a few people that you're seeing and you're not able to fit that information in there is a page at the back question 15 you can put all the information in there extra information that you need to okay the next section is about your health condition or conditions or disabilities so in this section you'll be listing what health conditions you have and you need to list all of them even if you don't think that they're relevant to you applying for this they still need to go in OK, um, it may be that as you go through the form, you suddenly remember something you've forgotten about. Just come back, pop it in at the start. Um, you know, it might be, for example, you get skin psoriasis and it's very itchy and you don't think about it because it just happens once in a while. But actually, when it does, you need someone to help put on some cream or whatever sort of thing. So, you know, it might seem essentially irrelevant, but actually it might might be re more relevant than you think so everything has to go in there uh, and it's important as well because they will be checking things against your or not in every case but it, it's a strong possibility that they will check things against your medical history so uh, put the approximate start date of that in there uh, some conditions lifelong so you might say lifelong that's fine uh, some uh, if it's if it's over 30 years then or over any amount of time like well it was 10 years ago it might be more just put 10 years plus that's fine uh, and yeah just uh, don't be too specific as well so if um, you have uh, so if you've got Parkinson's um, then it might well be that uh, you've got a number of things that happen as a result of the Parkinson's. You don't necessarily need to list all of those things. If you have balance problems and you have Parkinson's, the fact that you've put Parkinson's will cover balance problems. You don't need to put that in. Um, so it is, it is just looking really at the health conditions. Obviously, if something isn't diagnosed, but it's under investigation, then put that that's in there and that it's under investigation or during the diagnosis period or whatever so that might be the case if you have significant memory problems and you're going through the process of being assessed for dementia you know uh, something like that okay so that will cut there for you section two about your health condition or disability uh, this one's quite important obviously uh, it's listing all of your health conditions and disabilities so um, you need to put down everything that you have even if you don't think it's relevant to your uh, application um, you know it may be that you have things that uh, sort of the fact that you have multiple problems adds up or uh, it might be that you have something that to you doesn't seem that much of a big thing but actually to to someone else it, it might seem more uh, for example psoriasis of the skin maybe in your hair something like that it doesn't crop up often but when it does it's quite itchy and painful you need someone to put some cream on for you whatever so uh, it can be any little thing certainly any problems that you have with any of your organs your vital organ um, Anything like that that's ongoing needs to go in there. Heart condition, breathing problems, vision problems, hearing problems, liver, stomach, digestion, bowels, all of that 
Any, basically anything goes in there. Don't be too specific equally. If you are, uh, say you have Parkinson's for example, um, and you've listed that, then you don't need to also put that you have severe balance problems. That kind of comes with the territory, so to speak. So uh, some things are implied and that's absolutely fine. Give the approximate start date if you don't know the exact one. So you put 10 years, 10 years plus, 20 years, lifetime, something like that in those gaps. Very simple, very simple. But just uh, make sure you get everything in there. And it doesn't matter if later on you remember something you forgot and you need to add it uh, before you finish the form, obviously. And with all these applications, if you do forget anything whilst it's being processed, you can send additional information in to be looked at. So the next uh, question to be is uh, about medication and medical treatments that you might be having. So you would uh, ideally, if you've got a printed prescription list, you could pop this in. So if you're writing it all out, uh, that would be useful. Um, if you don't have that, uh, obviously list it all here, the frequency that you take the medication and the dosage amounts that you take. Uh, this includes inhalers, eye drops, uh, all of those things. You know, it may, as I said before, you may think it's relevant, you may not think it's relevant, it doesn't matter, just stick it all in. Uh, also, any treatments you have in, obviously dialysis, that would go in there, chemotherapy, anything like that. Uh, but as I say, any, any treatments you are having, uh, dressings being changed on a regular basis by a psych, uh, com a community nurse or, or, or something like that, a district nurse, thank you. Yes, so uh, everything, physiotherapy as well, if you're doing anything like that, that all needs to go in there. Uh, speech and language therapy, possibly. Uh, maybe you're recovering from a stroke and you're learning uh, to, to speak or chew and swallow food again. So, you know, things like that all goes in. So now we get down to the nitty gritty, which is the uh, questions about how your health condition or disability affects you and your daily living activities. So the first question is about preparing food. This is uh, quite, uh, they're all important, all of these questions are important, but preparing food is something that indicates to them all kinds of things. Um, it, it, it's an indication of your ability, uh, obviously, to prepare food, uh, but also it's an indication of your uh, physical ability to do essentially quite simple tasks. So, um, as with all of these questions, it asks you if you need to use any kind of aid or appliance. That could be anything. It could be a perching stool, could be a kettle tipper, uh, or it could be uh, some modified pans, possibly, or uh, maybe your kitchen itself has been modified in such a way. You know, if you have, uh, if you are a wheelchair user, you might have everything at a lower level. Um, all sorts of stuff really could go in there. Um, it might also be that you've had to purchase particular cooking equipment that you would normally need. Um, so it might be that you have to use a, an electric mixer more often to, to do certain things because you can't stir, for example. So, you know, things like that. So it might be something that I, I wouldn't use a mixer. I would just do that with a spin. So, uh, do you need help from another person? It usually asks you uh, this for every question. Uh, and again, with these things, it says yes, no, or sometimes. Um, we used to say to people, don't put sometimes unless you absolutely have to. And I would say, don't put sometimes if you do something every day, but you just on and off do it during the day, because every day is all the time, really. Um, but, uh, you know, if, the, if there are occasions where you are able to prepare a meal then you know that's good but look at how you're doing that if you're just making toast then you know um, 
but obviously you're not necessarily going to require any assistance with that but does that really count as a full meal so you know think about that carefully before before you tick that box if you do have help don't be afraid in ticking yes then of course you've got the actual section where you need to explain uh, the actual issues that you have with cooking and preparing a meal so it may be that you're not able to prepare a meal at all and that you need somebody to do absolutely everything for you um, that might be that you have possibly a learning disability uh, that prevents you from doing that uh, it might be that you are unwell uh, significantly unwell so that you can't stand up for long periods of time you can't lift heavy hot pans or um, you get extremely tired or maybe you get dizzy fall over things like that so the actual being there to prepare a meal is um, just right out for you and if that's the case then you need to be detailing that as much as you possibly can if you are able to prepare a meal say using a microwave or using an oven um, then you know kind of say well I can I can just put a meal in the oven and wait for that to cook and then take it out of the oven but that's all I can do I can't chop I can't this and that and the other so try and look at every aspect of the cooking process and go through that yourself can you do these things yes or no can you chop can you stir can you carry hot pans can you carry tr a tray you know do you need a trolley do you need to uh, have help for somebody with this part but not that part sort of thing so go into as much detail as you possibly can with this uh, obviously you're going to want to get across any um, pain or discomfort that you might get while doing this any tiredness you feel uh, any confusion might be memory loss most importantly any risks are you going to cut yourself? Are you going to burn yourself? Are you going to leave something on the, the pan because your memory is not very good? Um, you know, is there a possibility of, uh, you know, dropping things or, you know, cutting yourself from things that you've dropped and broken, you know? So uh, for people with visual impairments, that's, that's a big issue. Again, for people that are deaf, there's a lot of auditory indicators that we use when cooking that you may not have. So just go through with a fine tooth comb because actually um, preparing food is something that we kind of don't think about. And if we just stick a meal in the microwave, well, yeah, that's simple. But why are we doing that? Is it because we can't do the rest of it? So, you know, really go in as much detail as you possibly can with that section. And again, if somebody is, is cooking for you or preparing for you, delivering a meal to you, whatever, make sure you detail that as well. So the next section that follows on from that is eating and drinking. Uh, again, the same things are asked here do you use an aid or appliance so you would say if you do so that could be weighted cups adapted cutlery uh, might be the use a spork or something like that it's a spoon that's a fork that's a knife uh, it might be that you uh, even just use a cup with a long straw on it, it could be as simple as that um, you know just have a think about how you get food and drink into you you know is there anything that you need to add to that to make that process easier for you um, it does ask if you use a feeling tube some people do uh, some people might have one up the nose they might have one uh, through what they call like a jpeg possibly into the stomach something like that or through the navel um, where the food is administered in that way um, that can be quite difficult it might be that you're doing that yourself i don't knew one chap who had to sort of pump it in he had like a pump and did it himself at home some people need to have assistance with that they have a carer coming in so um you know that's quite an interesting question really if you tick yes to that make sure you go into more detail do you need help from another person to eat or drink so it might not be that you need somebody to physically put food in your mouth although you may uh, it might be that you have vision problems and need to be told if you spill food down yourself or where the food is on the plate so that you can find it. 
um, might be that you have perception problems. So you know you need to be told what food is what, or possibly uh, memory problems, and you need to be encouraged to eat because as you're eating you forget. Or it might be that uh, you get very very tired when you're eating, and that you just need somebody to to kind of encourage you to keep eating because of your tiredness. So it could be things like that, you know, uh, it might be supervision, just simply to make you s make sure you're safe. So look into all of those things before answering that. And then obviously they want the detail as well. They need to know uh, about your eating and drinking. And again, this is really important that you are getting across everything that you might do for yourself or that someone else might do for you. Uh, and it, it could be opening a packet of crisps, it could be uh, getting the food into your mouth, putting it on the table, it could be chewing, swallowing, digestion, maybe you have problems with choking, uh, you might need your food cutting up or mashing up, you may need to eat certain types of food and possibly you need support with uh, seeing what is in each type of food. Uh, you know, particularly if you're diabetic or, or celiac or something like that, you know, that those things are, are going to be an issue. A lot of people get very tired when they're eating. They might fall asleep or uh, struggle with their breathing or things like that and, and need to take a long time over it. Uh, as I say, it might be difficulties with memory, all those kind of things. So the more detail that you put in there, the better, as always with these things. Um, some people find that they have to eat at strange times a day and that that needs to go in there as well you know or it might be uh, if somebody has dementia for example they're waking up in the middle of the night and they want their dinner you know and it's 4 a.m things like that so you might get those things as well so that all kind of comes in into this also look at the effects of not eating it might be that you're not able to eat at all uh, maybe you have anorexia nervosa or uh, it could be that you have uh, a condition that maybe makes you vomit quite a lot so you're not able to keep food down, something like that. So again, be looking at those things in that kind of detail. What happens? Do you get tired as a result of it? Like because you're not eating, are you more prone to infections and illness and so on? Um, so make it clear if you're not getting enough nutrition and the effect of that in there. Question five, managing treatments. Now I'm romping through this because the pit form is very, very long and uh, I'm aware this video can run very, very long. Managing treatments. Again, uh, this, this is as much about the planning of treatments as much as the actual administration of the treatments. So um, it, obviously if somebody has problems with memory or confusion or uh, you know they have a learning disability or difficulty then it may well be that their medication is administered by a carer uh, a professional carer or, or uh, possibly a family member something like that uh, so that information would need to go in here uh, but also including that the collection of the medication uh, arranging for it to be delivered all that kind of thing that's important too Again, there may be issues with the person actually physically taking the medication. Can they swallow it? Can they get it down with a glass of water? Or do they need it to be broken up, made into smaller pieces? Uh, do they have to have things as a liquid instead of a tablet? That sort of thing. Uh, again, with uh, eye drops, might need somebody to do that for you. Uh, eye drops are notoriously difficult. To, to put in for some people. For me, I can just bag them in, but other people do get very, very stressy about doing that. Um, could be could be dressing wounds, if you've got uh, bed sores possibly, that you need to have someone come out and dress for you. Uh, it might be that you have, um, maybe you've recently had an amputation, something like that. You know, there's quite a, quite a few things that could be going on there. Um, you might be looking at uh, maybe you're diabetic and you continually need to monitor your health conditions, uh, your insulin, and you have to do the uh, sugar test or sugars test 
every once in a while during the day uh, and then manage your insulin on the basis of those numbers which requires you know some skill there again uh, it might be that you're doing that for someone or someone's doing that for you so also think about the monitoring as well you know does somebody have to monitor your state as much as anything else it might be your mental state it might be like I say something like diabetes or maybe your uh, blood pressure those kind of things be looking at all of that does somebody help you with that or even do you do that for yourself and if maybe you're incapacitated you'd need somebody to do that for you uh, so yeah and again physiotherapy dialysis all of these kind of things count so you'll be talking about all of them do make sure you tick the appropriate boxes for this it's again about aids or appliances so uh, as in the case with uh, blood pressure you might have the thing on your finger um, diabetes the uh, blood test um, if you uh, have breathing difficulties you might have oxygen tanks you might have all of those kind of things uh, quite a lot and then obviously the question about do you have anyone to help you with that and again with this you're always thinking about do, does doing these things or dealing with these things does it call me any cause me any illness or tiredness stress fatigue um, worry anxiety any of that you know how am I after I've done what I, I've done you know some people that develop uh, insulin dependent diabetes in their later years might have an issue with injecting themselves with a needle and that might cause them quite a lot of anxiety you never know what it's it is or how important it's going to be so if you get it even if you think it's not that important pop it in question six washing and bathing uh, do you use any kind of aid or appliance to wash and bathe yourself including using a bath or a shower um, so clearly we're looking at things there like uh, anything from a back scrubber, a shower seat, uh, a grab rail, uh, could be a particular type of adapted bath or shower that, that you need to use. Uh, it might be one of these baths that raise up so that someone can bathe you. Uh, it might be also things that you know uh, people have a lot of problems with reaching certain areas it might be that you have something other than a brush that helps you reach certain areas things like that um, also do you need help from another person so you may not get the help but do you need it um, it might be that you have a carer that's physically helping you maybe your partner or, or somebody that comes in professionally to do that and they might only do one small part, maybe they just wash your back or, or do your hair for you. It might only be one small thing, but if they do, it goes in. And then again, you're putting in the detail with this section, as before, as much detail as possible. Uh, you're looking at everything, you're looking at how you get into the shower, how you get out of the shower, how you get in and out of the bath. If you're unable to shower or bath because of uh, physical difficulty to get in maybe your particular living environment isn't suitable for you to do that you don't have a walk-in shower you've just got a normal bath with a shower over the top and because of that you can't get into the bath and you can't have a shower lots of issues lots of issues there uh, around that so make sure it all goes in certainly if you're looking at parts of the body that you might have difficulty washing so your hair or your feet that are the most common ones or people washing their back or around their uh, backside or genitals those can be difficult areas it might be that you have skin condition you have to be very careful that you don't you know, damage the skin or something like that um, maybe the steam causes a problem for your breathing when you're in there uh, it might be that you um, get particularly tired when you're washing or bathing. Uh, you know, there's there's all manner of things that can go on here, like I say. So make sure it all goes in. Uh, and look at how you are afterwards. Do you need to recover? You know, do you only shower once a week because it's really difficult and the rest of the time you just have a sort of, uh, you know, top and tail, quick wipe down with a flannel. 
if you are doing that, how are you doing that? Do you need a perching stool to sit in the sink? You know, do you sit on the toilet seat? Do you stand? Do you support yourself on the on the on the sink while you're washing? Things like that. Um, looking at drying yourself off as well. Can you dry yourself off easily? You know, all very important. Same with toileting. So you're looking at do you use an aid or appliance? So it might be a toilet frame to get on and off the toilet. It might be a bottom wiper. They do exist. Uh, it might be uh, that you uh, maybe you've got continence problems, so you know you're using pads, uh, maybe a device, a collection device of some kind. Uh, it could be internal, could be external. Might be that you need support with that. So again, do you need help from another person? Make sure you tick that box. And again, go into as much detail as possible here. If you've got continence issues, talk about them here. You know, do you? Is that an issue when it comes to going out? Do you always have to use a disabled toilet? That's a very important thing to to underline. You know, some people have difficulty using the toilet, but they can use a normal toilet. Some people just cannot use a normal toilet. They have to have a disabled toilet. Uh, again, memory or, um, or Cognition or comprehension is also an issue here if somebody's not able to toilet themselves in terms of, you know, intellectually speaking, they don't know how to do that. They need reminding um, or they need encouraging or uh, guidance and direction while they're actually doing some of the things in there. Um, you know, things like that it might be that they, they're able to do it, but they need checking afterwards. Have they put their clothing straight? Have they got any... Um, detritus on the, the hands or, or feet that, you know, or back, back of the shirt or anything that needs cleaning off. Uh, you know, it could be, it, there's lo loads of things that it could be. So if it's related to um, any of that, pop it in there. Can't do any harm. Dressing and undressing, very much the same. Uh, do you need to use an aid or appliance? Yes, no, sometimes. Do you need help from another person to dress or undress? So we might be looking at um, modified buttons, uh, front fastening bras, Velcro fastening, generally shoe aids, audio colour detector, visual colour detector. You get some apps that do that for people with vision problems. Um, there's all manner of things that, that you might use to help you get dressed and again with people helping you it might not be that they help you for the whole thing just at the end you know they do the buttons or they straighten your tie or they help you on with your trousers or just your socks whatever it is it doesn't matter how small it is make sure it goes in um, and again you're looking at not just the actual physical putting clothes on but also taking clothes off that's important too that can be tricky people can fall over people can get in a tangle or a muddle you know, there's a lot of different things there. So look into, you know, exactly how you're doing it mechanically, sort of thing. What type of clothes are you wearing? You're wearing clothes that are easy to get on and take off. That's a big issue. Uh, you know, elasticated clothing. Uh, could be tracky bottoms, jumpers, sweaters, things like that. Again, do you have any issues with buttons? You know, arthritis, dexterity, uh, zips. Uh bras, you know, even if you don't have a front fastening bra, you might do that thing where you put it around and you swizz it around, that uh, people tell me about. Uh, I've heard it in stories. Um, so yeah, that's worth looking into at the end of the day. It, it could, could be quite important. And again, with uh, dressing and undressing, always make sure that you're looking at how this affects you, you know, could tire you out. It might be that you have to get up extra early because it takes so long for you to get dressed. Um, it might be that if somebody kind of drops something on you, you can't do it because you need that extra time. So all those kind of things need to go in there as well. Um, and be very clear, very clear with this section. Uh, the, uh, the descriptors on this very much relate to can you address the top half independently, the bottom half independently, and they sort of section off your body as to how 
disabled you are by which parts you can and can't dress, which is very odd. Uh, so do do be very, very specific and very clear about what it is that you are doing for yourself. Communication. Uh, this this is quite important. There's a few crossovers with communicating and mixing with other people. So it may be that you repeat some things in one section and in the other section, but they can apply in both, essentially. It's a bit of an odd one. Uh, but communication, again, do you need to use an aid or appliance, or do you need help from somebody else to do these things? So aids and appliances, hearing aids, uh, might be a visual aid of some description. Um, picture symbols, uh, some people might use Makaton or uh, sign language, things like that. Um, and again, in doing any of these things that may need somebody else to, to support them. It might just be that they need to take a bit of extra time with things. Communication can be about everything. Um, so although we, again, look at reading in the next section, uh, it might be that you have a text reader that reads you, you your text messages and also allows you to type text messages by voice so that you're able to do that. So that might be something worth mentioning in this section, even though uh, it also comes under reading, possibly. So it, it's sort of all of those kind of things. Often people can find communicating very, very tiring, uh, very difficult. It might be that they're able to communicate in a sort of chit chat kind of way, but not on the phone with somebody about something serious or important, and they need support to do that, particularly for people with maybe dementia or learning disability, something like that, that kind of communication. Uh, you know, you can have a chat, they can express themselves quite clearly, but getting into the nitty gritty of uh, why there's been an increase in their uh, power bill from NPAL when they have used less energy, not more. Um, you know, things like that. Uh, that. That might not be something they're able to do so easily and they might need support that way. So even if it's arguably not a huge amount of support, you know, and that person can communicate, they still need support with actually accessing services in the normal way that you or I might. Uh, also, memory comes into this a little bit. Uh, if you uh, have issues with remembering words or losing the conversation, the thread of the conversation where it's going, all that kind of stuff, um, you know that that that's important too. Uh, some people can get headaches from from talking or or having to talk to people, uh, things like that. So uh, yeah, again all of that into there as much information as possible reading very kind of obvious really but uh, you know can you read a letter what sort of size print can you read if at all uh, can you see signs and symbols as well can you recognize a sign or a symbol you might not be able to recognize words but you might recognize a stop sign you know so what level does that go to and this can apply to anything uh, it could be uh, letters that you've been sent, it could be trying to navigate somewhere, uh, going to the doctors, going catching a bus, anything like that where you need to read. We read constantly throughout our lives without really thinking about it. Um, uh, do make a note as well if somebody always read a lot for pleasure, books and things, and then they suddenly stop doing so, that might be worth commenting on. Um, it might be that as you're reading you have memory problems, you can't remember what it is you're reading, you're able to physically read it, but you can't retain it at all. So again, that would be an issue there. Uh, if you've got macular degeneration or anything that affects your eyes, mention that here as well. And again, if you need people to read things for you, explain things to you, um, that would go in here as well. Mixing with other people. Now, this is a tricky one. Uh, generally speaking, there's a lot of issues for a lot of different people on mixing with others. Some people don't have any issues at all 
that they may have multi other multiple disabilities. And actually it might be that you have issues mixing with other people that you're not aware of because you've got used to those things. So yeah, again, think, think, think quite carefully, take your time with this one. Um, it might be one that you sort of skip past because you're just, well, I'm quite a confident person and I still you know, keep up with my friends. You know, uh, but actually there might be, might be things that are happening that you, you, you're just not aware of. Um, so it could be anything. It might be that you suffer anxiety and distress when you're out with people. It might be that you have issues with your behaviour and how you present yourself. Or uh, it might be that other people might find your behaviour uh, upsetting or confusing or distressing, even though it's not for you, in the case of various different type of Tourette's. Uh, or, uh, you know, post um, behavioural variant frontal temporal dementia that might be one where you might do things that people aren't expecting and that might make things difficult if you've got vision problems it might be that you need someone to speak for you uh, or to tell you when it's your turn to speak you might need people to directly use your name when they're addressing anything to you or tell you when you're next in in line in a queue or to be served you know things like that um, you know, even getting a waiter's attention somewhere might be tricky if you've got a visual impairment. So there's those kind of elements to it as well. Mixing with other people might require that you have somebody with you to communicate for you. And again, this comes with the communicating, but uh, it might be that without that person available, that you're isolated in some way. And so it might be that if you don't have that, you are currently unable to talk with people or unable to um, interact with people. And you might be suffering loneliness because of it. So there are those elements as well. Uh, it may be that you get distressed or confused if you've got dementia, something like that. Um, you know, so... so Go through this with, again, with the tooth comb. I mean, you have to with all of these questions, and I keep repeating myself in that way. But, uh, again, as with this, with everything, think about how it affects you when you've done these things. Some people can mix with, with someone for an hour a day, and that's it for the week. They're wiped out. Um, that they, they, they would love to mix with people a lot more than they do, you know. Uh, it might be that people are. In, it might be that you're embarrassed about your health conditions if there's something that's particularly noticeable by other people. It might be that you you're self-conscious about that and that prevents you from mixing with others. So again, think about all of these things. Making decisions about money. This is a bit of an odd section. Most people are able to make their own decisions about money. Uh, it may be that somebody needs to have their money counting out for them if they've got a visual impairment and saying this is a 20, this is a 10, blah, blah, blah. Uh, your fives, your ones, your twos, your threes, your fours, your 20 pounds. Um, yeah, those kind of things you're looking at uh, having support there. Uh, it might also be that you need somebody to help manage your bills and things like that. Quite often people with learning disabilities and may have a carer that they employ uh, or they live in a shared house that's run by carers and, and their finances are managed by the care company. It might be that you just uh, have somebody, you know, uh, helping you with uh, a lot of older people might have somebody help them with their finances because they just find it too stressful uh, or, or something like that. So. So making decisions about money, again, going as m into as much detail as you can on that. Mention if you have power of attorney for anybody as well, uh, if anyone's taken over doing things for you, possibly. Um, so, but essentially, you know, that's, that's a fairly simple section, really. Personally, not sure it warrants its own section, but for some people it may. Going out, very, very interesting section. So this is about following a route, planning a trip out, uh, going to somewhere new, going to somewhere familiar. Uh, 
For people with visual impairments, going somewhere new is obviously a huge, huge issue and they more than likely need support to do that in some way. And it might be that they get support from people that are in that area when they go to it, or it might be that they take someone with them to support them all the way along. Uh, but even in an area that is familiar, someone with visual impairments will have difficulties, uh, people parking in stupid uh, places that wouldn't, you know, normally be blocked and you know there's a car in the way they're walking to the car a boards outside shops all that kind of thing um also reading signs and getting around all of that kind of thing is important equally uh similar things for people with dementia maybe that they're not able to plan a route they need supervision and accompaniment while they're going on those routes so you would uh want to be you know giving extra time uh, to, to going out and uh, might be that that person wears a GPS locator in case they go missing um, or get lost or confused in a, a, even in Tesco's car park it can happen uh, might be that somebody has continence problems and you have to plan for the continence you know where are the toilets where are the rest stops uh, do we have to take do you have to take equipment with you uh, to prevent any accidents uh, equally, there's other conditions where you have to take equipment, uh, you know, oxygen if you've got breathing problems. Uh, might be that you have a heart condition. You need to always be within 500 metres of a, a defibrillator or um, you're not allowed to leave a certain area because the only place you can have treatment is at a certain hospital. Uh, you know, so there are those kind of factors as well. Um, and again, you're looking at the, the stress factor, how it affects you long term to do these things. You know, you can pop in to the shop to get a, a bottle of milk. It's a very familiar route. But when you come back, you're so uh, tired or uh, distressed from doing that, that, you know, makes you struggle for a day or two. So... Think about those things as well. How's it affecting you to, to go out? You know, what do you need to have with you? What plans do you need to make? You know, who do you need to have with you? And again, this is where we're looking a lot more at anxiety and and stress, and worry, and things like that, because this can be quite quite an issue for a lot of people with the depression and anxiety. Is just going out and doing simple things. Um, and it may well be that they need support to do that, uh, particularly if you've suffered some kind of trauma or, or whatever, you know, those kind of things. It all, it all counts. Um, you know, and there is a marked difference between a route or a place that you know and a route or a place that you don't know. So do be very clear if there are differences, you know, in, in how you might approach each situation. Uh, and do there is a question are you unable, are you able or unable to go out because of severe anxiety or distress I think uh, simply with that leaflet just dropped through the door uh, with that be very be very honest you know uh, if, if it's frequent don't put sometimes, you know, if it's like every other day or every day, then put yes. Um, only put sometimes if it's kind of like once a month, you might have a panic attack sort of thing. If it's a, 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 a sort of five out of seven, four out of seven days that you're dealing with these things, and just tick yes, don't tick sometimes. Um, so, yeah, and again, this is as much information as you can put in. Moving around is the section that's most important for mobility because they're looking at your ability to mobilise. And they ask you how far you can walk. Now, what you tick in this box is really important. So think very carefully about the distance that you can actually walk before you need to, to stop kind of thing. So it might be that you're able to, to get quite far over a long period of time, if you frequently stop, I want to know how far, or they want to know how far you can get until you stop and kind of go, that's enough. 
I'm going to need to rest before I can go any further. So uh, they give the example that 50 metres is the same as 50 buses end to end, you know, which is kind of true. Five buses, not 50 buses. 50 metres is five buses end to end. Um, yeah. Do you use an aid or appliance to walk, walking sticks, walking frame, crutches, prosthesis, uh, wheelchair uh, is the next question. And again, you're putting as much information as you can about that. Also look at how you move around your home. You know, do you furniture walk? Do you support yourself with furniture to get around the house? Do you use a walking stick when you're at home? Uh, do you have trouble with steps, stairs, getting in and out of your chair, getting on and off a toilet? Um, are you able to carry shopping while you're moving? Or are you able to carry anything while you're moving? Do you, are you likely to fall or... Uh, through balance problems or trips or vision problems do you uh, uh, do you have severe pain as you're moving you know or uh, again do you get out of breath and have to stop to catch your breath all of those kind of things again this is this section really the more detailed that or the more that you can put in to this section the better it's going to be for you I mean ideally, if you have got mobility problems, um, if you're not getting sort of eight points or more on this section, then you won't be receiving any of the mobility payments. So you have to really make sure that you get these things across. But bear in mind that anything that you say in this, they will sort of check on when they do the visit or when you do the, the, the assessment, face-to-face -face assessment. Um, they may visit you in your home. They may ask you to go to a place to, to do that. Um, you know, there are horror stories about people you know, with crutches getting there and finding that they're on the top floor and that there's no lift and that they force themselves all the way up there and then that counts against them. Uh, things like that. Can't say that those things aren't going to happen. You know, there is uh, a number of these things that do happen. A lot of people have to go through an appeals process completely unnecessarily because of stuff like that. And it is very likely. Um, but you've just got to do what you can. Uh, it's area dependent as to whether you get a home visit or whether you have to go into the office a lot of the time. Um, you know, if you're, if you're going to, quite often it's the job centre or, or some uh, council offices or benefits offices, whatever, uh, you, you'll find that, uh, that that's duty area. In some areas, they just do home visits as a sort of matter of course. So um, do check with that. If you have real serious problems with attending in a physical place, then push as much as possible for that home visit. Uh, if you if you are ill, don't don't go doing it uh, just for the sake of it. You know it's their job to accommodate you, not the other way around. So do insist on that as much as possible. If you're having difficulty with any of that, with whether it's dealing with Capita, Atos, Maximus, whoever, whichever provider it is that gets in touch with you for the health assessment, um, you know don't. Uh, don't, don't be backwards in saying what your difficulties are. Don't, don't be afraid to say, no, I can't come in. I physically cannot make it uh, for, for these reasons, you know. It's, at the end of the day, it's uh, as much their responsibility as it is yours. And you are the person with the disability, not them. It should be them that's coming to you. So, so that's important to bear in mind. Uh, question 15, the final question is, like I say, just the space to enter any information that you've not been able to get into the previous boxes. For a lot of people you will have, um, you may fill all of this as well as what was in there before because actually there's that much detail. But it is really important that you get as much in as possible. If you can uh, fit it all into there, then even better really um, but it, 
I mean, it's two pages in the in the modern up to date form. If you can fit it all in there, then then brilliant. They don't like separate pieces of paper necessarily, but don't be don't forget that you can provide extra information at a later date if you wish, um, or uh, or send further evidence in there. Just make sure you put your name and your national insurance number on the top of any additional sheets of anything that you send in, even if it's just a prescription list. Make sure you, you do that. Uh, the next section will ask if there's any special requirements that you need for uh, the face-to-face -face interview. Uh, do pop that in there. And then obviously you have to sign the declaration, date it, print your name at the end. Uh, it will be free post. I strongly recommend that you copy uh, the document before you send it off. Uh, if you've got a s decent smartphone or a tablet with a, a reasonably good camera on it, then that's the easiest way of copying things these days. Just take photos of it um, and keep it safe. They very rarely go missing in the post, but some do. So if you want to send it recorded delivery, that's up to you. But obviously that will be at your cost. Uh, some people prefer to do that to know that it definitely gets there. Uh, even if it is received... Sometimes it can go missing after the fact, so you know um, that only guarantees one part of its journey. Uh, but like I say, once you send that in, usually within about three weeks, you'll be contacted by one of the uh, companies to to begin the process of uh, having the face-to-face -face assessment. Uh, all of that's covered in part three. So do like, share, subscribe. Head over to part three. Uh, obviously, this has been quite a long video, uh, as expected with the PIP form. You might not have watched all of it. If you have, or you've got to this point, or you've watched any of it, thank you very much for doing so. I hope this has been a help for you. Uh, if you've got any comments or anything that you want to add that's you know going to help people out with writing a uh, PIP form or anything like that, please do put it in the uh, comments box below. Uh, obviously legislation and processes and procedures or um, things change all the time so anything that I'm saying now isn't absolute guarantee this is the way it is sort of thing there's always going to be areas where things may change or, or whatever and some of those things are, are geographical as well where uh, things happen one way in Newcastle and completely different in Devon so you know, there's regional variances as well. So bear all that in mind. Take your time with the form. Uh, write it out, possibly first on separate sheets of paper before putting it straight into the form. Uh, if at all possible, get somebody who's professionally trained in filling out a PIP form to do it for you. Uh, explore local charities, uh, organisations like AGK, CAB, um, Stroke Association, Macmillan anything like that, have a chat with those guys and maybe that you can get support with writing that. Also look at websites as well, the RNIB do a very good uh, sort of checklist to go through to help you with that. The Alzheimer's Society also have similar documentation as well that help you when filling out these forms. Uh, so it's worth checking out those websites too. Um, so yeah, I hope this has been helpful for you. Thanks for watching and uh, look out for the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.